So I've talked about how we got permission to do the 1960 Kennedy-Nixon debates, and also how the ideas of American debating stem all the way back to the early days of the country with the debates in 1830, 1844, 1858. The Kennedy-Nixon debates is the next thing that we're tackling, but first, in this lecture, I want to propose an alternative history to the Kennedy-Nixon debates. Now, those debates are the model for what presidential debating would become all the way up into the very last presidential debates we had at the time of this recording, which were Biden and Trump. Those debates, you can draw a direct line between the things that happened there to the rules established through the correspondence between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy and the Republican and Democratic parties. But there is an alternative we could have had. That alternative was broadcast on May 17, 1948. Harold Stassen, the former governor of Minnesota, and Thomas Dewey, the governor of New York, agreed to debate each other in Oregon prior to the Oregon primary. In this lecture, we're going to look at why that debate is the way we should have gone in American presidential debate, not the way that the Commission on Presidential Debates has decided to run things. I've talked a little bit about the primary system and how it's differ, different from today. The primaries were um, uh, bellwethers for whether or not somebody could be a national candidate or not. They weren't essential like they are today. But the Oregon primary became extremely essential between Dewey and Stassen. What they decided to do was a radio debate, and that radio debate was picked up by all of the major networks and broadcast to over 40 to 80 million listeners across the country, not directly involved in the Oregon primary, but Americans who would decide who the next president would be in the 1948 election. Now, this wasn't out of the blue. There were a number of popular radio programs and other broadcast programs like NBC's Town Hall of the Air and other things that have been running since the 1930s that were precursors to the modern political debate show, but they were uninterrupted debates. They were debates about a single topic between people who opposed each other so that audiences could hear the different points of view. They certainly weren't controlled or dominated by journalists the way they are today. On shows today like uh, Meet the Press, where it's much more about the journalist and their ability to ask probing questions than it is really about the issue or the people. There are several great things about this primary debate that I want to talk about. The first is that it is about one thing, and that's about whether or not the Communist Party should be outlawed in the United States. I have reached the conclusion that the communist organizations in the world are absolutely directed by the rulers of Russia in the Kremlin. I have reached the conclusion that the objectives of these communist organizations in the world are to overthrow free governments, to destroy the liberties of men, and to bring other countries under the domination of the dictators of Russia. Governor Stassen took the affirmative, saying it should be outlawed, and he grounded his support in something called the Munt-Nixon Bill. This bill was a bill that would require the Communist Party members to register and register uh, what they're doing financially and things like that. Stassen interpreted this as a bill that would outlaw the Communist Party because it would outlaw their ability to function. Thomas Dewey took the other side, saying that we should keep the Communist Party legal because that way we will know what it's doing. Dewey worried that uh, driving it underground would make it much more powerful, and that's the arguments that he made in the course of the debate. I want to talk about the debate in specifics, but I'm going to show some clips here and there so you can get a sense of what the debate sounded like and what it was like. But here's why this model is better than the model that we ended up with after Kennedy-Nixon. First, there were no journalist questions. Not one. In fact, the debate is moderated, moderated, by the chair of the Oregon Republican Committee. And I think he's just monitoring the time. He doesn't interject in any way. So there's no journalist questions. There's no agenda other than the topic that the two candidates agreed to debate, should the Communist Party be outlawed or not. In debate theory, it's incredibly important to have one topic that can either be affirmed or denied as the focus of the debate, not to decide the truth about the topic, but in order to allow the debate to generate the kind of words, the kind of phrases, the kind of discourse that's necessary to help people form their opinions about larger questions, i.e., can this person reason? Does that make sense to me? Does this person have a sense of evidence that's similar to my own? Those questions are extremely important. Secondly, 
there's one topic for the entire debate. I already talked about this a little bit, but they're not moving every 10 minutes into some bizarrely different topic, economy to foreign policy to education. They're not doing that. It's one topic. And through that, you get a sustained sense of how this person sees the world, how they construct an argument, and how they push for their beliefs in light of opposition. I've talked about this too. There are two clear sides that are distinct. We know what each person is supposed to say, what they're standing for. That is what makes the debate really fantastic. You don't get that in modern presidential debates. You don't get that at all. They can talk about anything they want because there's no focused topic. In the Stas and Dewey debates, they have to talk about that topic because they have to frame why they're doing well in the terms of what the other person has done and what they've done in the course of the debate. This is a weird one. They're allowed to directly question one another and they question one another in a way that works. Why does the Commission on Presidential Debates ban this practice? As we'll see later, we'll see why that comes to be, but uh, we've never seen a debate, I've never seen a debate in my lifetime, where the candidates are allowed to directly question each other, and I bet you haven't either. This is a model of how to do it well, and you can see what it adds to the debate. Let's take a listen and see how uh, Harold Stassen offers questions to Governor Dewey, and how Dewey responds to those questions, and you'll see the power and the ability to differentiate these candidates from each other in terms of, well, not only how do I feel about this Communist Party question, but how do I feel about these two people's ability to reason and advocate, which is the actual issue involved in any candidate debate. Take a listen to this. In order that we might narrow down our discussion and find out just exactly what the differences are in our positions, I should like to ask Governor Dewey specifically these questions. One, do you agree that the communist organizations throughout the world are directed from Moscow. Two, do you agree that the objective of the communist organizations throughout the world is to overthrow free governments, destroy liberties, and bring the countries under the domination of the Kremlin? Three, do you agree that communist organizations throughout the world are a menace to future peace? Four, do you agree that because of this menace to world peace, it is necessary that we require American young men to serve in our armed forces, and to take military training. To make my position then clear, I say very definitely that it does not add up to me to say that loyal, patriotic young Americans must of necessity be drafted, that their liberties must be taken away in order to make America strong in the face of the menace to peace caused by communist organizations, but that none of the privileges and blessings of legality should be taken away from the communist organizations themselves, which in fact are causing the menace that makes the drafting necessary. In the answer, he asked me four questions. One, do you agree that the communist organizations in the world today are under the direction of the Kremlin in Moscow? Certainly. Second, do you agree that the world communist organization is a threat to world peace? Certainly. Third, do you agree that the objectives of these communist organizations is to destroy the liberties of other men? Certainly. Finally, uh, fourthly, uh, do you, if you agree to these things, under what provisions of the Constitution, uh, as I took my quick notes here, and what legal action are you against uh, outlawing them when we are drafting young men in time of peace to build up the defenses against communist aggression? This, uh, the last question, of course, entirely begs the question. The question is not whether anyone is interested in helping any communist preserve his liberties. No one in America has the slightest interest in the communists. My interest is in preserving this country from being destroyed by the development of an underground organization which would grow so colossally in strength were it outlawed that it might easily destroy our country and cause us to draft all of the young men in the nation. I would say that that's higher quality than just about anything you see from the commission era of presidential debating. Another reason, the topic is rooted in a policy framework. What do I mean by this? Well, the topic says there's a thing that needs to be done, so it allows the candidates to talk about how it should be done. What should the policy be? What should the procedure be to make sure that this thing happens properly and that it works? This allows candidates to re arguments not only in the, um, the, the should, but in the how, 
which I think is important to see how they operate, how they think, uh, how they uh, push their position. You don't just get the idealized, yes, we should stand up to communism, but you get, a, you get a much more specific sense of this is how we should stand up to communism in these ways because of these reasons. And they have to bring in evidence and things like that in order to support their case. This allows for sustained discussion, not only on the should, the values, the things we stand for as the people interested in this question, but also what is the policy going to be and how is it going to work? This is something that we don't really see in presidential debates today either. It's really great. And finally, they have to target their arguments at someone, the audience. The audience has to decide who's won the debate. Instead of trying to appease a journalist or say, I want to answer this journalist's question, or I don't think this question is relevant, which you see a lot of times in contemporary presidential debate, or what I call commission debates, the Commission on Presidential Debates setting them up. In this debate, what you see is appeal directly to the listeners to say, I have done what I need to do to prove my side of this motion. Here's how I've done it. Here's how my opponent has failed. He says he is for the month bill because, says Mr. Stassen, it outlaws the Communist Party. But the fact of the matter is, he is in grievous error. The only authority he quotes is the head of the Communist Party, which is not exactly a very good authority for what is truth. Usually, if a communist says it does this, you know it does the opposite. So let's find out whether the Munt bill does up outlaw the Communist Party. That's the first job. Even though that question might not be the most relevant question in the world, whether to ban the Communist Party or not, in 1948, pretty darn relevant, uh, but even any question today um, wouldn't be timeless. What is timeless is you get to see how they reason, how they construct arguments, and how they think, which is such an important value to having a good, clear, binary debate on a topic, is you get to see that reasoning process and how they engage with challenges to that reasoning process. The Stassen-Dewey debates, a forgotten debate in American history. I'm glad I was able to share a little bit of it with you today. In the next lecture, we'll look at Kennedy-Nixon. And even though those debates are considered to be uh, historically important and valuable, and they are, they really do pale in comparison to the Stassen-Dewey debate. I wish we had more of the Stassen-Dewey than what we end up getting from the 1960s and beyond. But Nixon-Kennedy in the next lecture. Nixon and Kennedy in 1960, keep in mind the specific things that make the Stass and Dewey debate so powerful, so unique, and such a better model than what the Democrats and Republicans come up with in 1960. Unfortunately, this debate that I've talked about in this short lecture has been lost to history. Not a lot of people talk about it, even fewer know about it. If only it could be recovered as a model that the commission would take seriously, but unfortunately, the parties get to determine what the national election debates look like. And the Commission on Presidential Debates lets them do it, and they're open about it. This is all because of what happened in 1960, which we're going to cover in the next lecture.